Welcome to another episode of Around the World in 40 Tales to celebrate Storytelling Alberta's 40th anniversary. My name is Doreen Vanderstoop, and today we feature a story by Chantal Chagnon called The Cre Creation Story. Now, before we dive in, I'd like to acknowledge that our organization operates on the traditional territories of the Indigenous signatories to Treaties 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10. And that includes the Métis Settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. We make this declaration with honour and respect. Now, Chantal Chagnon is a Cree Ojibwe Métis singer, drummer, artist, storyteller, actor, educator, workshop facilitator, social justice advocate, and activist with roots in Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. She shares traditional Indigenous songs, stories, culture, history, arts, and teachings. Chantal has presented at conferences, conventions, galas, fundraisers, community, social justice events, and in classrooms from preschool through university. She has performed at the National Music Center, the Saddle Dome, the Jubilee Auditorium, Jack Singer Concert Hall, and many other stages showcasing traditional and contemporary Indigenous music, stories, and knowledge. Chantal entertains, engages, enlightens, educates, and inspires everyone she meets. I give you Chantal Chagnon with the Cree creation story. Pense and everyone. So this story is, I should call it the recreation story because we were here before. We're known as the two leggeds because of course we walk around on two legs. Now, as um, we were first created on this planet, uh, there was a spirit called Wasakajak. And Wasakajak was supposed to teach us how to live on the land. He was supposed to teach us how to take care of the earth and the air and the water and how to take care of the animals and how to honor and respect each other. But Wasakajak, uh, he is a little bit lazy and he kind of dropped the ball on that. And so we didn't learn how to live in a good way. And so because we didn't learn how to honor the land and harvest appropriately, we were ripping everything out by the roots. We were taking more than what we needed and just leaving everything that we didn't use everywhere. And so the plants didn't have an opportunity to recover or grow back. And so all of the crops and fields, they just started dying. And there was really not a lot for us to eat. The animals who we were also eating. We didn't honor and respect them. We were hunting them too early in the season and we weren't giving them a chance to replenish themselves either, just like the plants. And so they ended up almost dying out to the point where all of the ones that were left ran away from the two-leggeds because they knew we were bad news. The two-leggeds didn't take care of the water or the fish and they were throwing their garbage in the water and the water started to run almost black with sickness and the fish started to die. And then all of the air, because it couldn't be filtered by the plants and it couldn't be helped by the water, that started to get sick too. So it became harder and harder and harder to breathe. And the two-leggeds, when there was very, very little left, there was very little in the way of water, there was very little in the way of food, no animals to be seen anywhere, they of course started fighting over the scraps that were left and in turn, killed each other out. And Creator saw the whole mess of the earth and thought, whoa, 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 wait a second here. All right, we need a do-over. We need a mulligan because obviously the first time around with the two leggeds didn't go very well. And so Creator was looking for Wasakajak and saw him sleeping under a tree and said, oh, it's time. And so it started to rain. Now Wasakajak, he was protected under a tree. And so he didn't really get too wet. So he continued to take his little nap. And as it continued to rain harder, the bank of the river that he was sleeping close to started to get higher and higher and run over his toes. So he pulled his toes up and he continued to try and fight and nap some more. And then that river continued to raise with the waters falling from the sky and hit his knees. Then he woke up with a start and he realized that this rain wasn't going to stop anytime soon. And that all of this water was going to continue to raise and raise and raise because 
creator needed a mulligan. And so he thought, okay, well, if the earth is going to flood, we're going to have to rebuild the earth. And I'm not quite sure how to do that. So I'm going to go talk to the beaver because the beaver is the smartest animal I know. So Wasakajak went to the beaver and he said, beaver, beaver, there's going to be a flood coming and we're going to have to save any animals that are left and we're going to have to rebuild the earth after it's done. What should we do? <laughs> and the beaver thought for a moment and she thought and she thought and then she said, well, let's go talk to the cedar tree. The cedar tree was the oldest living cedar tree on earth. She had seen the rise and fall of so many portions of the earth. And she was so old and wise. She was thousands of years old. And her size was just magnificent. You could drive trucks through her. She was huge. Um, and she also had all of the wisdom from all of her years. And so the beaver went to her and said, cedar tree there's a huge flood coming how are we going to protect the animals and how are we going to rebuild the earth and the cedar tree said very graciously beaver you will have to cut me down and hollow me out and all of the animals that were left will climb inside me and i will protect them and then you can rebuild once the flooding is done and the beaver didn't want to cut the cedar tree down she said no cedar there, there has to be another way and the cedar tree said very graciously again, no beaver, there's no other way. I've seen this happen before and I hope not to see it happen again, but I will be back. And so very carefully, the beaver cut down the cedar tree. The cedar tree was so, so large that when she finally cracked and fell open over, as she hit the ground, the whole earth shook. And all of the animals heard the shaking and felt it in their bones and so ran from all directions to the cedar tree. And as they got there, they saw a beaver was hollowing out the beautiful cedar tree. And they knew that this was their last chance to be saved. So all of the animals climbed in the beautiful boat that the beaver and the cedar had created. And they waited as the final animal got in the boat it began to rain harder and harder and harder. And they watched as all of the rivers burst their banks and spilled onto the land. As the oceans rose over, coated the earth and linked up and connected to the rivers until the whole earth was coated in water. And as they continued to watch it rain harder and harder, they watched as the land sunk deeper and deeper and deeper into the darkness of the ocean. And then they waited for what seemed like days and nights and days and nights. It seemed like forever. They didn't think it was ever gonna stop raining. But then one day, it did. And Wasakajak knew that meant it was time for them to rebuild the earth. But how were gonna, they were gonna do that? Mm, I'll go ask the beaver, because again, the beaver's the smartest animal he knew. And so he went to the beaver and he said, beaver, beaver, it stopped raining, we can rebuild the earth. How are we gonna do it? And the beaver said, and she thought for a moment, and she thought for a moment, and she thought for a moment, and she said, well, I suppose someone would have to dive down to the bottom of the ocean and grab some land so we could rebuild. And Wasaka Jack said, that's a beautiful idea. Who's gonna do it? And the beaver said, well, I'm a pretty good swimmer. Let me try. And so the beaver hopped out of the side of the boat. She swam down deeper and deeper and deeper, but she couldn't reach the bottom. There was no way she could hold her breath that long. She came up to the surface and said, Wasakajak, it is so far down. I don't think anyone can reach the bottom. And Wasakajak said, well, it's pretty far down, but I'm sure the biggest animals might be able to reach the bottom because they're so big. Maybe they'll displace some of the water and they'll get to the bottom. And so he asked the larger animals in the boat, who can reach the bottom? Who can swim and reach the bottom? And the moose said, well, I can try. I'm a quite a good swimmer and I can always reach the bottom of lakes. Let me try. And so she dove down deeper and deeper and deeper, but of course she couldn't reach the bottom. So she swam up to the surface and said, Wasakajak, it is so far down. I could not hold my breath that long and I don't think anyone could reach the bottom. I couldn't even see it. And so she got back in the boat. And the bear, who was always quite proud, 
of himself and was like, well, I could try. I'm a pretty great swimmer. So he dove out of the boat. But unfortunately, it was shortly after hibernation season, so he'd put on a lot of weight. And so he just kind of bobbed in the water a little bit. And all of the animals said, oh, bear, get back in the boat. This is unbearable to watch. And so he climbed back into the boat. And then Wasaka Jack said, well, what about the best divers? If you guys can fly so high, you can dive so deep. So perhaps the divers could do it. Well, the eagle who could soar the highest said, well, I will try. And so the eagle soared high, high, high into the sky and reached the highest point than he'd ever reached before, dove straight down into the water, but could not reach the bottom. And then the kingfisher, who is probably the most efficient diver of any of the birds, most of the animals actually, saying, well, maybe I could reach the bottom. I'm a fantastic swimmer, a fantastic diver. Let me try. And so the kingfisher flew the highest that he had ever flown before, took the deepest breath when he reached that highest point and dove straight down into the water, cutting it like a knife. And he used his wings to push down deeper and deeper and deeper. But unfortunately, he couldn't reach the bottom either. He swam up to the top and said, Wasakajak, it is so far down. I don't think anyone will be able to reach the bottom. And then Wasaka Jack asked the best swimmers, well, you guys are the most wonderful swimmers. Beaver had already tried. Who else is a wonderful swimmer who can hold their breath for a really long time? And the turtle said, well, I can hold my breath for a very long time. And I'm a great swimmer, so let me try. And so she dove out of the side of the boat and the turtle dove down deeper and deeper and deeper, but, the deeper she got, the harder the pressure on her shell became, and it started to crack. As she swam up to the surface, and she pulled herself back into the boat, all of the animals looked at her shell, which had cracked into 13 pieces, with 28 tiny cracks along the edges, which is now what we see in the turtle shell. And she said, with Sakajak, it is so far down, I don't think anyone can reach the bottom. And then the fastest swimmer said, well, we could probably reach the bottom. And so the fastest swimmer of them all, who also has the most fun, the otter, jumped out of the boat and he dove down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, but he couldn't reach the bottom. He came back up to the top and said, was that it's so far down? There's no way anybody could reach the bottom. I couldn't reach the bottom. There's no way anybody could reach the bottom and climbed back into the boat. All of the animals were feeling without hope. They had waited so long for the rain to stop. And now that it had, they couldn't even rebuild the earth because they had no earth to rebuild. And all of them were feeling overwhelmed and saddened. And then there was a tiny voice from inside the, vo the boat that said, I can do it. And they all looked around and they said, well, who said that? And again, they heard the voice, I can do it. And they looked around and they said, again, who said that? And then the tiny little muskrat came through the crowd of animals, stood up on her hind legs, puffed out her chest very proudly and said, I can do it. And all of the animals just started erupting in laughter. All of the great, great, large animals said, <laughs> muskrat, you're so tiny and puny. How are you supposed to reach the bottom? We couldn't reach the bottom. All of the divers started laughing at her saying, muskrat, you're not a good diver at all. How are you supposed to reach the bottom if we couldn't reach the bottom? The best swimmers started laughing at her saying, oh, muskrat, there is no way you could reach the bottom. We couldn't hold our breath that long. How are you supposed to reach the bottom? And then all of the fastest swimmers started Started laughing at her. <laughs> Muskrat, you're so slow. There's no way you can reach the bottom. We can reach the bottom. How are you supposed to reach the bottom? And so as all of the animals were laughing at her, she ignored it. And she stood on the side of the boat and very proudly exclaimed, I can do it. She took the deepest breath that she'd ever taken in her life. And she dove straight into the water. And she dove down deeper and deeper and deeper. All of the animals realized Muskrat was gone. Muskrat had left the boat, and they watched over the side to watch her disappear into the darkness. And then they waited. And they waited for her to come back, but she didn't. And then they began to worry. As it got longer and longer, they knew that there was no way that Muskrat could have held her breath that long. As they watched over the side of the boat, they saw a single bubble of air float to the surface and they knew 
that that was Muskrat's very last breath. And they started to cry. They cried and they cried and they cried so hard that they turned all of the ocean salty. They said, Muskrat, Muskrat, why would you do that? Why would you give up your life? And we can't even rebuild the earth. And then Wasagajak continued to watch over the side of the boat for any, any form of hope. And as he watched, he saw a tiny silhouette floating out of the darkness. As that shadow got closer and closer and closer to the boat, he realized that with Muskrat's lifeless body. And so as she got close, he reached in with all his might and he held her close to his heart and he began to cry. He cried and he cried and he cried so hard that he wiped all of the color off Muskrat's belly. All of the animals were so sad that Muskrat had given her life for them. And as everyone was crying and wondering what to do and they felt without hope and they had lost their friend, Muskrat's tiny little paw flopped open. And in the palm of her hand was a little ball of earth. Muskrat had done it. She had reached the bottom with her last breath and brought it back with her for her friends so they could rebuild the earth. All of the animals were so overjoyed that they could rebuild the earth, but so sad that they had lost such a good friend in Muskrat. It was a very strange feeling to be so sad, but so happy at the same time. And Wasakajak took that ball of earth and said, well, who will carry this ball of earth on their back? The turtle said, I will carry the earth on my back and climbed into the water. And as she did, Wasakajak took that ball of earth and he rolled it in a circle. As he rolled it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it got heavier and heavier and heavier until it pushed the turtle beneath the waves and until it branched out so much that it created all the land we now see all over the world, which is why we call our Earth Turtle Island. And Wasakajak knew he had to get to work. So he asked all of the animals to leave the beautiful cedar boat and go to their place on the earth. And then he took a deep breath <gasps> to the east. And as he did, Grandfather Sun came out from behind the clouds. A huge rainbow of hope shot, uh, shot across the sky. And as Grandfather Sun warmed the earth, all of the little plants started to grow back. They just started to sprout everywhere. All of the beautiful animals, their bellies became full and pregnant with the babies. And then Wasakajak took a deep breath <gasps> to the south. And as he did, the earth began to rumble. It began to shake. Huge mountains started shooting up and reaching into the sky. Huge hills started rolling across the prairies. Beautiful landscapes started to develop. Deserts started to develop. And beautiful valleys formed. Wasakajak took another deep breath and he blew again to the west. And as he did, Grandmother Moon came out and she shone with all her might and she pushed with all of her love and all of the waters washed over Turtle Island. As she pulled, all of the waters receded. She pushed again and the waters rushed forward. She pulled back and the waters receded. And as she did, she became, she pushed the tides in and out, in and out. This is why Mother Moon controls the tides. And then all of the uh, different lakes and valleys and streams and rivers all began to form all over Turtle Island. Then Wasakajak took another deep breath <gasps> to the north. And as he did, the winds began to spin. All of the earth began to spin. It started to spin faster and faster and faster. Grandmother Moon and Grandfather Sun started to push and pull and push and pull with all of their might to slow the beautiful earth down. And as they did, they created the days and the nights, the weeks and the months and the seasons and the years, the decades and beyond. And all of the winds as they spun all over Turtle Island, the plants and the animals took a breath for their very first time and were gifted a sacred breath, which was a breath of wisdom that we all share. And we've been sharing that same breath with our ancestors for many, many years. And then Wasakajak took that beautiful muskrat and blew into her, that 
breath. <sighs> and Muskrat <gasps> took her sacred breath. She came back to life and she was so thankful and humbled for Wasakajak to give her her gift of life. Wasakajak was so thankful, as were all of the other animals, for having the ability to rebuild the earth, for Muskrat's sacrifice of her own life for the betterment of everyone. And to this day, the muskrat symbolizes hope, and she symbolizes sacrifice for the greater good. And that is the Cree creation story. Warm thanks to Chantal Chagnon for this offering for our 40th anniversary celebrations. If you want to reach out to Chantal or anyone at Storytelling Alberta, you can reach us by email at info at storytellingalberta.com. Thank you so much for joining us around the world.